is it um, selects who the speaker is. So as soon as you start saying something, it'll focus on you. You want to start? Uh, yeah, you can switch back to the, um, the spreadsheet. I have it written there. Oh. Uh, <laughs> that looks so cool. All right. So let me, <laughs> this is fun. Let me share my screen. There you go. OK, perfect. So what do you want to start with? Um, yeah, so a lot of these were mine, actually. Um, <laughs> But the, the non the, the, the chip seek one, I guess first is like an overview of what that is would be good. But yeah. um, you you mentioned like were you there for the epigenomics lecture? Uh, yes, I, I remember the part about feeding the bunnies and the goats. Yeah, so you're you're just making an antibody that recognizes yeah. you. and then you basically put metallic beads on these antibodies. Okay. And you you use the metallic beads to pull down the antibodies and whatever they stick to. Okay, yeah, the pull and whatever they stick to is, is effectively the part of the chromatin. So you basically take the DNA, you chop up the DNA, you hybridize the, um, you basically use the you know sticky antibodies to basically pull down whatever antigenes they were trained against, and you pull those down, and then they get to the DNA. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. And then how do you separate the antibodies? That's more of a, like an implementation thing, but once they've attached to the DNA fragments, how do you get them off? Oh, then you basically reverse the cross-linking. So you basically, you first cross-link them, and then you reverse the cross-linking. So you basically, you first cross-link protein and DNA. You basically use a sticky thing that sort of makes protein stick to DNA. And then you pull down the DNA with a sticky thing. And then you reverse the cross-linking, and now the DNA is loose and you pull down the DNA sequences. Okay. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah, I don't exactly know how you reverse cross-linking, but that's something. There is molecular know. reactions for that. Okay. Yeah, so, you know, basically, you don't, you don't have to understand every molecular reaction. All you need to know is that there are things that allow you to do it. Okay. Okay, good. Yeah. Uh, next? Yeah. Um, I guess my question about next generation sequencing. Yeah. Um, like, so what have the advances been since Illumina sequencing? in the 2000s, like yeah. how has so, it gotten better? So um, let's start with how DNA sequencing was done in the early days. So DNA sequencing was done in the early days by basically having a bunch of wells, and then in those wells you would synthesize molecules that are longer and longer and longer and longer. And you could tell the difference between the length of a four and a five molecule, and you would run them past that gel, and then that difference in length would basically be used to recognize that whenever I'm using a radioactive A, I'm adding an A at the fourth position. And a radioactive B, I'm adding a, you know, sorry, C, I'm adding a C at the fifth position, and so on and so forth. So I would cycle through radioactive bases, and then I would see which positions light up, because that's when they would be incorporated. And then based on the difference in length, I could tell that I'm adding molecules of length 230, 234, and so on and so forth. Eventually, you couldn't separate them by length anymore because the ratio between 235 and 234 is simply too small. Like the difference is too, you know, basically you can't tell that, you know, that difference. Um, whereas the difference between five and four as a ratio is much bigger. Um, so that, that's why traditional sequencing uh, could only go to, you know, 200 bases, 300 bases, maybe even 1,000 bases, 1,000 nucleotides. Modern day sequencing, the next generation sequencing only goes up to 70 bases. So we actually went back in ability to sequence long molecules. But we got way better at the cost. So instead of costing $1 a base, now it costs $1 a megabase, <laughs> which is crazy. So basically, we went down in cost by a factor of a million. We went down in length by a factor of five, which is a good trade off, a million versus five. What are the new generation technologies? One of them is basically taking a DNA and putting it through a nanopore. And the nanopore measures conductivity. And different bases have slightly different conductivity. And like a methylated C has a slightly different conductivity than a, than a regular C. So you can actually read molecules that are gigantic because that doesn't depend on that ratio of length. So you can just go through with 10,000 bases. So 
Next generation, next generation sequencing is basically long sequencing. So some of the companies are Oxford Nanocore or Pacific Biosciences, PacBio, and so on and so forth. So you can read them up. They're a little outside the scope of the course, but again, it's the registration we get to ask any question. How expensive is that right now? Not as expensive as it could be. So it's, you know, it's not prohibitive, so you can actually do it. Yeah, so maybe it's a factor of 10, 15 times more than traditional so next generation. Cheaper than Sanger sequencing. Still way, okay. way cheaper than Sanger, but the error rate is bigger. Uh, in one of the meetings, the advances in genome biology and technology, not this one, that's the one happening next week, American Society of Human Genetics, but the other big genomics meeting, uh, the AGBT, uh, there was um, a fake news release uh, called CRAPSIC, and they had a cool acronym for what CRAP would stand for, but it was basically uh, announcing that they have uh, immediate sequencing where you can basically order your entire genome online and get it back immediately as you click pay and that it was um, only 99.9% .9 accurate. <laughs> and you get the idea, right? Basically, um, all human genomes are 99% .9 identical. So <laughs> you can basically give back any human genome and you're already 99.9% .9 accurate. And then the, the crafting technology was that you could sequence any species with 25% accuracy. <laughs> <laughs> immediate, super fast, amazingly long <laughs> molecules. So, so anyway, you can see where this is going, but basically much, much longer molecules, but the accuracy goes down. All right, other questions? Anyone else uh, wrote something on this forum? Yeah, go ahead. I don't really understand the difference between three, three, four, two, All right, so let's go back to that uh, three-dimensional genome lecture. So um, this is a great question. Um, I mean, they're all great questions. So let's see. OK, so what is high C, or what is 3C, chromatin conformation capture? Basically, don't worry so much about the differences between them. The main thing to, uh, to understand is how this works. Do you understand the basic thing of how this works? Who understands the basic thing of how this works? Raise your hands. OK, who does not? Okay, great. So, do um, you guys remember the idea with the Raymond chopped up with scissors? So basically, I basically have a bunch of pasta uh, in, my, in my bowl. And I have magical scissors that basically, when cutting the pasta, leave a little bit of radioactive material, okay, for example, or some gluey material. And that gluey material can basically allow the pasta to re-glue with another cut pasta segment. Who's 100% with me on that? Perfect. So that's exactly what these molecular enzymes do. So basically, I have a Hindi 3 side that basically takes DNA, which is double stranded, and sort of makes it a little bit you know, off. And that basically makes the DNA sticky to other segments that were cut by the same enzyme. Or you can cut them in a way that makes them sticky with a different enzyme, so that you have A and B segments, and so on and so forth. So after you've cut your pasta and you made it sticky, the pasta re-ligates with itself. Everybody with me so far? Great. The last part is how do I sequence now past that junction? You see, what I'm looking for is segments that are chimeric, that basically have a primer here and a primer there. So basically, this is what the original chromatin conformation capture approach does. So 3C is basically using PCR, polymer chain reaction, to basically figure out which single segment interacts with which other single segment. 4C is one by all. So you basically do first you know, the cut, and then you have one side, and you basically pull down who else was glued to me. So that's a one by all. Everybody with me on that one? So basically, I'm using one side only to amplify, and on the other side, I can basically 
capture anything. I can circularize my fragment and then use this and that as you know, the two primers on a circular DNA segment, and I can sequence the whole thing and then figure out who red was bound with across the whole genome. Raise your hands if you're with me. Okay. Everybody cool with like 4C? 5C basically says I have a bunch of reds and I can build a set of primers for that. And I have a bunch of blues and I build a set of primers for that. And then I ask who interact with whom. So I can basically build a 20 by 20 map of who's interacting with whom. So that was 5C. What high C does is that basically says, oh, forget about this. I'm just going to use a uh, biotinylation mark, like this little purple thing, to be able to then pull down any segment that was ligated. So basically what you're going to do is you're creating a, you know, um, fishing uh, hook with which you can pull down all the spaghetti ends that were recently joined. It's kind of like my scissors now not only has a glue that allows these things to stick together, but it also has, I can use the same glue to now pull down all the segments that were just recently stuck together. Raise your hands if you're with me. That's basically what high C does. Okay, so 3C is one by one, 4C is one by all, 5C is many by many, high C is all by all. Okay? Can I summarize it and see if I understand? Go for it. Yeah, of course. So when you do 3C, you do this um, like like this cutting ligation process. Yeah. And you perform PCR using a specific primer and a specific exactly right. second yeah. primer to just see if two specific ones are. That's exactly right. 3C is that with one primer to see. No, no, no. One. 3C is already the basic one. Okay. From a thing, from right. formation capture. Right. That's where the 3Cs come from. Right. 4C is yeah. with one primer exactly. to see what one specific gene is combined exactly and then 5c is that with many primaries exactly like each of those genes many pairs many pairs not what each of them is attached to the whole genome okay. but what which of the 20 is which of the 20 attached to okay okay so it's a 20 by 20 matrix yeah and Sandra, you hear the two strands of a negative and bond together they were like close to each other that's exactly right so basically the key idea is that as my, my spaghetti is floating around the bowl, it's kind of attached to its local neighborhood. So it doesn't go all the way out. It sort of stays locally close. So by looking at with what frequency were two spaghetti strands tied to each other, it'll basically tell me which chromosomes are near each other or which segments of this very long spaghetti thing are actually near each other. And that's where these maps come from. These maps are basically proximity maps that basically tells you that this segment here interacted with that segment there. And usually you see them close to the diagonal. That's basically because, you know, if I'm close, I'm more likely to interact. It's going to actually tie together in the same molecule. But this tells you that this entire se this segment interacts with something far, far away. Sounds good? Great. Yes? Oh, you've already asked one. Okay. Next, we're going to cycle. Oh, it's still not saying. Oh, yeah, go ahead. That's exactly right. So basically, the, the question is, at what resolution am I finding? Well, it depends on what resolution you cut. If I cut with scissors that only cut every 200,000 base pairs, then my resolution is 200,000 base pairs. But if I cut with scissors that are only 20 base pairs, you know, that cut only every 20 base pairs, I have a bigger problem. Why is that? The reason is that I'm trying to populate an n by n matrix. And if I have in 3 billion bases, 1 million cuts, that's 3,000 base per resolution, I basically have a 1 million square matrix to fill in. How many entries are there? There are 1 trillion entries in a 1 million square. So I better sequence at least 10 trillion molecules so that I have on average 10 you know, counts per cell of that matrix. How many counts do I want? Maybe on average 10. So, so basically I have to suddenly sequence 10 trillion molecules, and that's still expensive even with modern day technology. So if I cut very, very frequently, even at the resolution of, of 3,000 nucleotides, which is maybe by not super, super high resolution, in order to populate all these tiny little squares that I created on my grid, I have to go through 
you know, huge, huge amounts of sequencing. So instead, I like to cut with things that cut less frequently to have better accuracy. It's a little weird, right? Because you're saying, well, wait a minute, of course, the higher resolution, the better. But the problem is that there's a lot of uncertainty that comes with not populating these tiny little squares sufficiently densely. So when people try to push the resolution to smaller resolution, they're giving up on accuracy. And when you push the accuracy up by having more you know, counts per bin, then you're pushing the resolution down because you need bigger bins. So there's new technologies that basically do high C with capture. Instead of sequencing 10 trillion reads, I can simply capture all promoter regions in the genome. Just use hybridization to capture them and then see what, you know, and then sequence whatever comes out and then, you know, see what promoters we're interacting with or what certain enhancers we're interacting with or what 100,000 enhancers that I care about interacted with. Okay, so that's capture high C. That's a, a next generation kind of thing. Raise your hands if you're with me on this. Awesome. Good. Other questions? Change topics. Feel free to just read anything on the board. Raise your hands if you have a question. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so I see someone else also asked this. Um, can you explain what enhancers and promoters of promoters are? Yeah. All right. So that's going back to the genomics lecture. Shloop. And um, this, uh, okay. All right. So remember this three dimensional folding of the chromatin that's sort of somewhere in here. And then down, down low, you basically have DNA that's wrapped around nucleosomes. And these nucleosomes can have post translational modifications. Remember, these are the post it nodes that you have on your book of life. So if you're a plumber or a physicist, you're using different parts of human knowledge. If you're a liver cell or, or a brain cell, you're using different parts of the genome knowledge. And the way that you remember which part to use is that you use post it nodes on the chapter of the book that you're going to be reading. That's what these post-translational modifications are. So these post-translational modifications allow you to um, mark different classes of elements. And if you're, if you're, um, if you're a, I don't know, a liver cell, then the classes of elements that you're going to want to read are going to be in different places in the genome. It's the same classes of elements. You have post-it notes, you have highlighting, you have underlining. These are different types of modifications. So here's the modifications of the post-it notes. Um, CPG and nucleotides are the underlining. And uh, accessibility is the highlighting. Okay? So you have different types of markings, all of which are overlaid on top of each other, on your book. And depending on your profession, physics or you know, plumber, you have um, different parts of the book that are marked. So, you know, chromosome three, like chapter three, or volume three, position whatever, is marked active, like, ooh, this is really important for the plumber, but not for the physicist, okay? And vice versa, so basically liver versus uh, heart cell attacks. Now, as I mentioned, there's underlining, highlighting, and post-it notes. The post-it notes have different colors. The post-it notes have green color, red color, you know, orange color, etc. So, what enhancers and promoters are, are different color post-it notes. They're basically saying this is regulatorily important in a different way than that, okay? And these are the signatures of these types of elements. These are the signatures of enhancers and these are the signatures of promoters. But now, what is an enhancer? What is a promoter? Like, biologically. They both kind of do the same thing. They both recruit regulators to help transcription start, to help make RNA out of DNA and eventually protein out of that RNA. But they play roles at different stages of that process. A promoter is basically exactly where transcription will eventually start. And it just happens to have a red post-it note, which is H3K4 trimethylation and H3K9 acetylation and DNA. 
as the red positron, the combination that marks the red positron. The enhancer has a slightly different role. The promoter says that's where transcription starts. So it, it assembles the transcriptional machinery at that location and it starts. The promoter is basically always ready for business. It's kind of like having a stop sign in an intersection. That stop sign is always there. It's day or night, you're always stopping there and you go. Stop and you go, stop and you go. The enhancer is more of the red light and the green light, okay? So in, uh, you know, 8 a.m., you know, at 8 a.m., um, like lanes on the Golden Gate Bridge, when everybody's commuting in, the middle lane becomes always green. And when everybody's commuting out, the middle lane becomes always out. Sounds good? So basically, the, you know, so if I'm a liver cell, this light is always green because now, you know, I'm going to have to do this all the time. So enhancers are more dynamic. They're kind of like the stop signs and the you know, green light, red light. So promoters are stably always open for business. That's where transcription starts. Enhancers are extremely cell type specific. I will only turn on in the liver cell and I will only turn on when I'm you know, fasting or when I'm thinking and when I'm sort of running in my muscle cells and so on and so forth. So enhancers, happen to be much more distant from the transcription start site. Promoters are exactly there. Enhancers are A, more dynamic, B, more distant, three, more cell type specific, D, more variable across individuals, E, marked by different color post-it notes. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Biologically, we frankly have still a hard time figuring out what's an enhancer and promoter. A promoter is usually directional. A promoter starts and goes this way. But, you know, many promoters are kind of bad directional. An enhancer is usually upstream or downstream. But, you know, some enhancers are unidirectional. <laughs> um, um, you know, promoters are usually proximal. But, you know, some enhancers are proximal. Promo you know, the enhancers are usually distant. But, you know, so, and, and so and so forth. So basically, there's a lot of overlap between these classes. And there's some elements that show marks of both enhancers and promoters. And when you test them, they kind of function like both. And if you do an enhancer assay and you put a promoter instead of an enhancer, it kind of works like an enhancer too. So the distinction biologically and biochemically is a little fuzzy. But we like to think of them as two separate classes, although these classes kind of overlap. <laughs> kind of like your plumber might be doing physics on the side. So, <laughs> so is that what sorry, gene that is, regu that is regulated by both the promoter and the enhancer? Um, oh, every gene is regulated by one promoter and many enhancers. So usually you should think about 20 enhancers for one gene, one promoter for one gene. If it has an alternative transcription start site, two promoters, or maybe three promoters. Maybe it has a cryptic promoter that basically all, you know, goes to the same start site. But usually many enhancers. And uh, if the enhancer is off somehow, so I don't know, it's AB. Yeah, but um, all of its enhancers have to be off for the gene to be off. Usually even so. one enhancer, so I may be a gene that's used both for plumbing and for physics. I have um, one enhancer that's physics specific and one enhancer that's plumbing specific. Yeah. Uh, but in that case, it doesn't matter that there is a promoter? Like oh, it does, absolutely. So basically these, promo these enhancers will loop to promoter regions and then enable transcription. So basically the way that you should think about it is that DNA effectively loops around, bringing the enhancers in proximity to promoters, which then starts transcribing. So that's how, that's how it works. Basically, the enhancers eventually converge onto the promoter. That's why the promoter kind of has to be always open for business. Does that help? Great. Did everybody do learning stuff? Good. Other questions? You asked one already. Anyone else who hasn't spoken before? Yeah. Uh, what are metabolites and how do they interact with uh, enzyme performance networks? Um, let's look at. Uh, A substance formed or necessary for metabolism. There you go. <laughs> so here's some examples of metabolites. Um, <laughs> what are you guys? 
thing about is the crab sack. Crab sack. <laughs> Pretty close. There you go. Get my crab sack. Uh, okay. So these are all metabolites. This is what I call metabolites. Basically, they're kind of like molecules that can be metabolized back and forth to each other. So, you know, I'm, I'm using a much more general terminology than sort of, you know, it's basically chemicals that can be metabolized. Okay? So basically, here's a chemical, I'm adding, you know, something to it, and then I'm, you know, doing these reactions, and there's some enzymes that push me this way, and then other enzymes that push me the other way, and so forth. Okay? So these are metabolites. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Awesome. And, and basically the network is that every protein that carries out this reaction is an edge. Does that help? Yeah. Awesome. This is fun. Yeah, yeah, please. Could you talk about how single cell RNA data is generated and why it's like better or... There's a whole lecture on that. Yeah, we have a single cell lecture. So if you want the hour and a half answer, go to YouTube and check the lecture <laughs> from last year. <laughs> well, the lecture 21. Ooh, I mean, just search single cell. They're all linked from our uh, page, right? So if you go to, you know, uh, single cell genomics. Yeah, just click in your play the lecture. Basically, I don't want to spend the recitation time to sort of jump ahead in the course because then not doing it in the right order. But super important and super awesome. We had a cool single cell paper in May uh, in Nature. So I encourage you to look at it. It's like the first single cell dissection of Alzheimer's disease, looking at 48 human brains and how every single cell type is changing in the brain. And it goes far beyond what you can do with both. So you're going to have to wait for a subsequent lecture. Any other questions before we do repeats? All right. I actually have a follow-up question to the um, promoter answer one. Yeah. You, you called these marks post-translational. Post-translational. Sorry. Post, sorry. Post-translational, and I was confused why that is because yeah. there's not really translation happening. Well. Of course, of course there is. Um, how do I build a he's bill? Okay. Yeah. Right. I translate it. So there's a histone DNA segment that encodes it. There's a histone RNA that gets transcribed from it. It goes into the cytoplasm, and then I translate it into a histone protein. That protein is post-translationally modified. And then that protein goes back, or you know, before it gets modified, that protein now goes back into the, the nucleus, and then DNA wraps around that protein, and that protein can be post-translationally modified inside the nucleus. They have all the readers and writers of the epigenome that bind to that histone protein. That's an amino acid chain of a protein. And that protein has already been translated, and now it is post-translationally modified. It, it is modifying the DNA, or no. the protein is being modified? The protein is being modified. So I'm adding a CH3 molecule to that lysine in the fourth position of the histone tail. OK. Got it? That makes sense. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, to determine if like an enhancer is active or not, is it just whether the chromatin is accessible, or are there uh, other stuff as well? It's a fantastic question. So a lot of people <coughs> were wondering, how do I mark an active enhancer? Is it? active every time it's accessible? And the answer is quite complicated. The answer is usually no. Usually something will become first 
activated and then accessible, and then it will stay accessible, and then it might be deactivated. So accessibility and activity are related, but not identical. And let me explain. Um, this histone protein can be marked by all of these different marks. When it's marked by these marks, K9 acetylation, K27 acetylation, it usually indicates that it's, that, it, that it's active for business. Okay? What does acetylation do? Acetylation actually changes the polarization, changes the charge of the histones and pushes them away from each other. So you could think of acetylation not necessarily as an informational mark, but as a structural change, which basically kind of like loosens up the DNA. Um, it's like having a little wine. <laughs> it's now much more chatty. Okay? <laughs> Less inhibited. Um, so, so basically, these acetylation marks have a chemical difference that they make on the nucleus. By contrast, methylation marks are more about who reads them and who writes them, i.e., what are the proteins that we'll now be able to attach here because I have that methyl mark. So that protein has an affinity here that reads the methyl mark, but what does that affinity do? It just simply helps that protein get, get bound, and what does that protein get do? It does. It doesn't just call up its friend. It has another side that has another affinity for, I don't know, the transcriptional machinery that will then be more easy to pull down. So that's basically what happens inside the cell. You basically have these marks that kind of like loosen up the, the DNA, make it more chatty, and then these marks that somehow recruit specific things. It's kind of like you have a little bit of alcohol at the part, but you also have a name tag that says, I love physics. And then, you know, the other physics will recruit specific people, and the, you know, white wine will make you more chatty. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I hope it's illegal to talk about that. I mean, to be immoral. Sounds good? So, now, um, can, so the question now is, what is the difference between accessibility and, you know, um, activation? So the activation is not necessarily causal. The fact that it's acetylated could have a causal loosening up and making it more chatty. It could also have be, be the consequence of now I've marked it up as, oh, this side is active. So you should be cautious to not interpret all of these events as causality. Just because something has these marks doesn't mean that it will now become an active enhancer. Okay, some of the acetylation marks have that effect. Some of the methylation marks have the effect of recruiting proteins, etc. But others are the consequence of doing an action. For example, H3K36 translation. And you know, if you're not confused yet, try not to listen to this part. If you're, <laughs> because it might get a little confusing. So H3K36 translation is a mark of active transcription. What does that mark actually do? It represses binding to the DNA. It's weird, right? It's a mark of active transcription, but it's a repressive mark. How could that be? The reason is that you want to prevent reinitiation in the middle of transcription. So every time you transcribe, you lay out a mark that says, don't transcribe here anymore, I got this. Okay, and then you don't have this random initiation that's happening in the place that you're transcribing. It's kind of like doing, you know, saying, sorry, Work, may not work or something, right? It basically says construction zone, don't come here. So it's weird. It's an activation mark, but it's not an activation. It doesn't cause activation, it actually causes repression. So that's why you have to disconnect from your head causality from all this. There's a lot of correlation, but the causality sometimes is there, and sometimes it's reverse causality, and sometimes it's correlation, and sometimes it's the opposite action. It's kind of like saying, I find firemen, or every time there's a fire. Are they the arsonists? Are they fighting the fire? Right? So correlation does not imply causation. It sometimes implies reverse causation. Maybe it's the thing that, you know, etc. So now, um, activation is usually marked by the flanking nucleosomes. Because accessibility means that there's no histones there. There was a famous paper that was criticizing uh, you know, the ENCODE project by basically saying, oh, we looked at the sites that have K27 acetylation and we found that they're less active than the ones that don't. 
and they did not realize that they were looking here versus there. And of course, there you have the insignation mark, but the business happens here. You have the mark there, but you have to push away the mark in order to transcribe. So depending on what resolution you're looking at, keep interpolation might look like an active mark or might look like an inactive mark. Or it might look like it's correlated with higher activity, or it might look like it's correlated with lower activity. But you just have to understand the biophysics of that. And then it's very simple. It basically says that, yes, of course, when I'm bound here, I'm pushing away the leucosomes, and that's where the regulators are binding. That's where the motifs are. But then if you look at the DNA, at the high resolution view of that signal track, what you will basically see is that in the active regions, you will have a little bit of a dip in the chromatin. That's where the cool stuff happens. You basically have the marks surrounding it, but then the regulator binds in the middle and displaces the nucleosomes. So there's no histone modifications at that location of accessibility, but they're nearby. Sounds good? I'm bombarding you guys with information, but the goal is to get you to think outside the box, not to say, oh yeah, that's an active mark, therefore it's causal and it's activating, etc. You have to basically think what is actually going on in the DNA by the time Who's following so far? Raise your hands. Awesome. Who feels that they're learning something? <laughs> Good. <laughs> um, again, I'm here for you. Ask anything. Even if you, you can't quite phrase your question the right way, just like start talking about a topic and don't worry, I'll give you information about that. Yeah. So my, uh, the postdoc I was working with a few years ago said that there's a ton of biological data out there and people aren't uh, like, doing enough analysis of it, do you mm -hmm. think that's true? In your absolutely, opinion? absolutely, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm not gonna give a good analogy about that, but, or actually I should not. Um, <laughs> but basically, data is extremely precious, but after somebody has already published on it, everybody's like, look, it's weird. Like, data is like the most precious thing on the planet, but the journal will basically say, Oh, sorry, you're not generating new data. I'm not going to get as many citations. I don't want to publish your paper. It's very weird. So basically, people are constantly in search of generating new data so they can publish it so that other people can use it, but nobody wants to use it because it's already tainted. It's like, oh, that's already been published. I don't want to you know, work on that anymore. So um, it's very weird. So the, uh, the key to having an awesome paper is to have a combination of a cool new method, cool new data, and cool new biology. If you have all three, it's a nature paper. Okay? <laughs> if you have only new data, eh, the reviewer will say that, just a bunch of data, you didn't really learn anything. Okay? If you have only a new algorithm, they'll be like, yeah, you know, it's an incremental advance. <laughs> <laughs> if you have only cool biological things, it's like, oh yeah, that's been so shown before, 1978, when it's pretty good, I didn't show this. <laughs> 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 oh, <you're right. laughs> so, uh, the, the secret to writing really awesome cool papers is to not just use one data set, but to use many data sets. And then you gain new insights that you can say, well, yeah, sure, something was analyzed on this data, but by bringing this new data in, I now have a new insight. To find an experimentalist friend that will make figure five, that's basically, we did a gel, and we found that something's binding, da-da-da, and then boom, it's a nature paper. Okay? So, um, I'm oversimplifying, of course, but there's a, a huge amount of data that's not analyzed, and part of the reason is that the initial paper maybe have done a crappy job, or maybe everybody feels they did such an awesome job, there's not much more to look from the data set, but at the intersection of data sets, there's always something that we need to learn. So, I hope that answers your question. But the answer is yes, there's a lot of data out there that you can still analyze. And you should, and that's how you learn. And you should basically, that's why I'm saying for final project, find a cool data set, repeat their analysis, combine it with some other data set, find what's at the intersection, and then you have some cool new biology. Other questions? Yeah. Uh, I feel quite interested in the techniques you talked about, about uh, hy hybridizing DNA with other uh, whatever, like uh, ant ant antibodies. Mm -hmm. So I would imagine a crazy technique. I don't know if it, uh, it, it ever exists. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, if I know a, a certain sequence, is there a technique I can kill all the cell with that sequence in vivo so that I can do something like uh, uh, gene knockout? To our to 
do in quantum physics? Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, nature 24. <laughs> <laughs> uh, genome editing. So, you know, there are enzymes that will go and cut whatever piece of DNA you want to cut. In vivo? In vivo. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Don't do it at once. <laughs> it's called CRISPR. <laughs> Kind of like a lower level kind of question. Yeah, of course. So when you talked about like cooling down things, like I'm sure it like varies by context, but like we generally like experiment with like cooling down things, like in different cases. Yeah. So in the case of an antibody, I basically you know use my bunnies and my goats to basically build antibodies, and now I attach these antibodies to magnetic beads, and I actually just use a magnet. <laughs> I pull down all the magnetic beads. It's amazing. You basically let these like antibodies loose in the genome, you chop up the DNA, you have the protein there, they sort of bind all the histones, you cross them into the DNA and the protein, they're now bound to little caught up segments of DNA and they're floating with the protein. You then use a magnet and they're like, ooh, I'm getting pulled over. And then you, you arrive here, you watch the rest, you reverse the cross linking, you're left with just DNA, you wash down your beads, and you're left with just floating DNA, chopped up, that was pulled down by that thing. Does that help? Yeah. Great. So it doesn't need patch. Like yeah, yeah, pull down basically means just pull yeah. down. So basically, you basically use a magnet and you just pull it down, and then you wash the rest, and then you get rid of the magnet, and now they're floating again. Is that oh, cool? Thanks. I know you're wanting to ask something. Right? No, no, no. <laughs> no? Okay. I do have yeah, go for it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds great. Um, so I think the most key question you talked about the biophysics of the DNA interaction. Yeah. And you said it's the protein is kind of stealing the atoms yeah, of the DNA. Yeah, yeah. Like which atoms? Like exactly. And how, um, how does that work physically? Do the bases flip out once in a while? Just or one second, let me pull it up. Um, let me let me explain. This is a very good question. Mm. All right, there you go. So, you're asking if the DNA kind of opens up every now and then? Not open. Like, oh. I know thermodynamically, like, sometimes the bases flip out. The DNA. Um, you probably know more than me. <laughs> so, what do you mean? So, you, you have a base there like that. Yeah, and there are hydrogen bonds between the bases. Oh, I see, I see. I when you say flip out, out, you basically mean open up, like detach. Detach, and then like they just flip out. And then, like, yeah, so that's base. not what happens. Okay. So basically, um, you have a base pair which is actually formed. You either have three hydrogen bonds between C and G or two hydrogen bonds between A and B. Okay? These you can think of as ladder steps on this awesome staircase. Okay? Stay with me. Um, <laughs> so, so you basically have all these steps on the ladder and then on the side of the steps, that's where the recognition happens. So you basically have an A, which is kind of like you know this, and a T, which is kind of like that, and there's atoms sticking out of them. And when you're attaching to the staircase, I don't know, Mission Impossible style, you basically are attaching to the side of the stairs, not the top of the stairs, not the bottom of the stairs, but the sides of the stairs. So you basically can imagine a sort of helical staircase, and you're attaching to the side. And that side difference is shape if you have an AT, or a TA base, if you have a CG or a GC base, they actually change the shape of that wooden panels, if you wish, on your helical staircase. So now if I have a surface that recognizes a particular sequence, that's because the T had a little bump here and the A had a little bump somewhere else and the G had a little bump there. And every time I say that my motif is CGA, I actually mean C with G, G with C, a with T. And the fact that I'm recognizing CGA doesn't mean that I'm only looking at one side of the helix. I'm actually looking at a bunch of base pairs. 
Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. It's just like I, I thought I read somewhere that this. Yeah, I mean, the, the DNA has some kind of breathing. Right. And yeah, bases do detach, and when they do detach, they're kind of floating. But that's not when the proteins bind. Okay. Yeah, the proteins sorry. bind when it's actually on the double helical stable form. Yeah. And there's all kinds of weird structures. There's cDNA and ADNA and bDNA. There's like, you know, a lot of different configurations of that awesome lab. Yeah. So if they have one, do they have one composer and several Correct. Same enhancer will only work this gene. No, it will work. So how, what does the enhancer do? The enhancer basically recruits a bunch of proteins. So when it recruits a bunch of proteins, it can then loop to the left or it can loop to the right. It might loop to the right and contact three different genes. It might loop to the left and contact another gene. So one enhancer might contact many genes. The traditional model is that one enhancer contacts one gene. That's the traditional model. But the, you know, most common thing is that one enhancer kind of like recruits a bunch of stuff and then it loops around and it sort of interacts with a bunch of stuff. <laughs> it's not super, it's floating. The things that are in close to each other spatially. Um, not necessarily, but because of what I just mentioned, the answer is typically yes. So evolution uh, will tend to favor things that happen more frequently by chance. So if more frequently by chance you tend to activate a bunch of genes nearby, then sure, you'll put them together because they act together. So it'll be favorable to the cell if there's a rearrangement that now brings together genes that act together. Another way that you end up with co-functioning genes being in the same region is that you have local duplication events. As you're copying the DNA, you get a little confused, you copy it again, you copy it again. So you now have three copies of that gene. The genes take on different functions, maybe slightly different functions, now you have three genes that perform almost the same function that happen to be at the same location. So it's much easier to just co-regulate them while you're at it. Or you may have an insulator protein that will then sort of, you know, separate out these domains. So CTCF was initially thought to be an insulator protein. We published papers on that in the for my group, where we basically saw that if you have a CTCF binding site in the middle between two genes, they're much less likely to be co-regulated than if you don't have a CTCF binding site. So that suggests that CTCF has insulation functions. 10 years later, we actually figured out what that meant, that CTCF was one of the proteins that was involved in creating these cohesin loops. And therefore, because it was sort of binding there and creating these loops, it was pushing all the stuff on one side of it into a loop that was basically more likely to be co-regulated, while the stuff on the other side was in another loop. So yeah, there are sequence elements that you can put in between genes to stop the spreading of chromatin and stop the sort of co-regulation activity on the, you know, on the, on the chromatin. Other questions? Repeats are okay. Yeah. Uh, I guess I'm a little confused what the loop actually does. Like what does that structural change uh, do to affect gene expression? And also, what, like, what force is causing that loop to happen when the protein binds? These are awesome questions, and many scientists would love to know. In fact, <laughs> all scientists would love to know. So we don't really have answers to many of these questions. Basically, there are you know models for how things are thought to work, but what is the actual force? You know, probably ATP. Um, what is the molecular machine cohesion? And you know the cohesion complex is sort of the thing that sort of loops things around. Um, so a lot of things we're still you know figuring out. Basically, how do you do that by basically um, profiling a high C experiment with and without CTCF, with and without the transacting protein, with and without cohesin. So basically, this is a topological associated domain. You have the CTCF sites that are pointing inwards. You have cohesin that basically takes these CTCF uh, things and sort of pushes them in. So this is a stop sign. Cohesin basically forms these loops, and then the, create, the DNA sort of you know push through these loops. Um, that we kind of understand. Where's the energy coming from? You know, there's actin you know things inside <laughs> the cell, and then molecules kind of walk on them, and they they pull things, and you know basically when the cell divides, chromosomes are pushed apart. What causes that? Where well, there's actin filaments that are sort of pulling on the two sides. Where's the energy coming from? Uh, you know, ATP, sure, yeah. <laughs> so there's a lot of uncertainty around this amazing machinery 
that makes the cell function. And this is just one of those things that sort of, yes, we kind of understand the players. If you told me to write an equation that describes it all, I probably couldn't do that. I mean, and, and not just me, but like anyone. Like it's just not something that we fully understand. But basically what we're doing now is a series of experiments that try to sort of dissect, you know, what's sitting there? Well, we can do a pull down experiment. We can see what are the partners of cohesion. We can do a co-IP co experiment. We're basically using cohesion as a base. We're basically seeing who else comes with it. And then you do a mass spec experiment to figure out what are the proteins that just came down. And then from that, you can figure out, well, here are some of the partners. Like, for example, ZNF248 or something is associated with cohesion. Now it's understood to be a new additional player that was previously not known, but from the GP6 experiment, you can basically find co-localization of that new protein with cohesin. So you're like, okay, well, these are both players. Let me delete one and see what happens. Let me delete the other. Let me delete them both. Let me delete that other partner and see how the landscape changes. We're still figuring it all out. And a lot of the stuff that we think we know now, we may actually be wrong about. And in a few years, it turns out a new model is consistent with the old data, but completely distinct from the old model we had. What things they've learned so today? Yay. Should we do this more often? Yeah, <laughs> awesome. So I have office hours, but you know, instead I could also come hang out here every now and then and just you know talk with all of you guys. Um, don't feel that all of that is necessary. I'm trying to expose you to knowledge, stuff that you can then look up. You can Wikipedia a lot of these things, find links, read primary papers, learn more, watch videos online, etc. This course is trying to expose you to a ginormous field that keeps growing. I love that field, and that's why I tried to cover so much material from that field. And I could talk for hours at super high speed about any one of these topics, about any one of the slides. I can go on and on and on and on and on. So that's why it's very hard for me to exclude material, and that's why you end up with so much material on the board. But the goal is not to overwhelm you, it's not to freak you out, it's not to stress you out, and it's not to penalize you. The goal is to expose you so that you can then learn about all kinds of cool new topics and then look up a ton more information for yourself. So there's a balance between being exposed to something and then learning deeply about something. And that's what the project is about. That's what the concepts are about. That's where your own reading is about. Okay? So don't feel that you have to understand everything deeply. But if you don't ask me and I'm happy to provide information, if you do, that's awesome. But the most important thing is that you know where to start. And that's what classes give you. Classes give you breath. If you want depth, you do research. Or you take a specialized course on X or Y or Z. Sounds good? So don't stress, but just enjoy this amazing breadth of this field and hopefully depth on specific topics that you hear a lot about. Okay? Thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you.